when the Lord, Lord turned again the, the captivity of Sion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. That they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The word of God. I love the prelude. I love preludes. What do you think about preludes? Preludes are different than gathering music. Very different. When we come and we gather, that's, that's part of worship. I believe worship begins long before we ever get to church. We prepare ourselves for worship, our hearts, our minds. It begins when we wake up. In the olden days, people would prepare the night before for worship. They'd read scriptures from the morning worship the next day. And so they would begin the process even the night before to prepare when you get here and we gather, and, and I know it's, it's different for everybody on even getting here and how tough that can be, but then we sit, the candles are lit, the scripture is read, and we prepare ourselves to worship God. The prelude is that invitation. It's that, that call to, to come together, a call to remind us that, that when we sit together here and worship, that we are God's people called by God, drawn by God, and invited to sit next to the person maybe we know, maybe we don't know. But the prelude is the, the preempt. The prelude is what centers us. It's what helps us remember why we're here. And now I know prelude looks different for everybody. Maybe you're wrangling kids during the prelude. Maybe you're filling out your tithe check during prelude. I see a lot of things from up here, by the way. <laughs> Maybe, you're, maybe it's, it's a time for you to be quiet. Maybe you're just sitting. It's different for everybody, but the fact of the matter is that when we draw together and we, we have a prelude, it reminds us that we're here for God. It reminds us that whatever walk of life we are in, we've come together now for this next hour to be together. This passage today is a prelude for the Passion Week. It's a prelude for Holy Week. Let's read it. This is John 12, 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover came to Bethany, Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Jesus came to Bethany. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She brought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be Bethany was on the outskirts of Jerusalem. This is the layover spot. This is where Jesus gathered with this group of people. This was as close as Jesus had to a home during his ministry for the man who had no place to lay his head. This was home. Lazarus, his friend, was there. I love scripture passages where there's interaction between people. And typically my sermon format, when there's interactions with people, are to go through the eyes of each person. Because I believe we see ourselves in each person on a given day or another. So I'd like to do that today. It says in the scriptures, they made a supper for him, for Jesus. Lazarus was there, Martha, Mary were there, Judas was there. Lazarus doesn't have a heck of a lot to say here. Lazarus is risen from the dead. He's, he's walking in a resurrected body, but he's sitting at table. We don't know what's going through his mind. He's just sitting back and watching all of this unfold, as far as we know. 
but we know that he's there. Maybe he's figuring out what it means to live in a resurrected body from here on out. Maybe he doesn't know exactly what to do with this new life that he's been given, but he's there at the table. Then we have Martha. Martha's there. You know the passages, Martha, Martha. Having a merry heart in a Martha world is a book that our women's group studied not that long ago. Martha loved Jesus with all of her heart. Martha is devoted. Martha is, is compassionate. But the way that Martha shows her love are through the work of her hands and her feet. Martha is an action person. Martha gives with all of her heart and soul, but what she knows is to serve the hands and feet, literally, of Christ. Martha is somebody that is so important that we must never forget. Martha reminds us that it's just as possible to serve Jesus in a kitchen as on a public platform or a pulpit or a career lived in the eyes of people. Martha reminds us that ministry happens behind the scenes, that things need to get done, that things need to happen that allow us to minister to people. Martha loved Jesus with all of her heart. There's nothing that can take it away from her. We feel like Martha at times, I believe. And Mary. Mary, I would say, is the, the main character in this story. Same Mary that's going to be at the cross. This is Mary that's going to walk with Jesus. Listen to what she does. Mary anoints Jesus' feet with this rare perfume, expensive perfume, And then she doesn't grab a towel to wipe his feet off. She doesn't grab a cloth or use the table napkin. She uses her hair. She puts this perfume on his feet and she rubs it with her hair to wash his feet, this costly perfume. Evelyn Underhill says that it's summed up in sacrifice, this act of worship. Mary could have done so many things with this perfume. It probably could have paid for a lot of her life. But she gave it to Jesus, not counting the cost, but anointing his feet. Now, this is interesting because there are other accounts of this this house in in Matthew and in Mark, but in those stories, the woman with the perfume anoints Jesus' head. That's a very prophetic kind of action. When you anoint somebody's head, it's a great honor. It's It's like anointing a king. You might think of when Samuel anointed David's head while Saul was still on the throne. It was very dangerous, but it was, it's anointing, lifting up the person that you, you anoint. She doesn't do that. She anoints his feet. What does that mean? What does that mean? Think about the foot washing at the Passover meal on Monday, Thursday. Think about a burial. She's beginning to prepare his body, like where they would wash the person over beginning with their feet. They would wash the person. Maybe she understands something that nobody else is quite getting yet. That Jesus truly isn't going to be there forever in body. Maybe she's finally accepted what the disciples have not accepted yet. The death of their master and Messiah. Washing somebody's feet in this way, what a humbling, humbling experience. Have you ever had to wash somebody's feet? Just in general? There's a holy emblem of the disciples' life, washing and being washed. Mary did that. Mary did that. And John's Gospel says, and the fragrance filled the room. I want to park here for a second. And the fragrance filled the room. If you read John's gospel often and you look at it very closely, John often has a double meaning to the words and phrases that he uses. I like this one. And the fragrance filled the room. William Barclay says that anybody that performs an act out of love, out of devotion, the fragrance fills the room. The fragrance fills the room. Anytime God's people act out of compassion, love, care. Anytime when God's people goes out of the way to sacrifice something of themselves for somebody else, that fragrance can't help but fill the room or the sanctuary or the church or the community. It has a way of spreading. That small act of Mary filled that room and that house. She's teaching us how to be church. She's teaching us how to be the church. And then you have Judas. He's in here. 
And when I was preparing this and, and thinking about it, my first thought was, why is Judas there? Well, why is he even in the room? Jesus knows who Judas is. Jesus knows who we are. Jesus can see the inside of our hearts. You can't hide from God. You can't hide the inner feelings and thoughts that you have. God knows everything about us. There's no, there's no trying to hide from that. Why is Judas even there? Why is Judas at this table? Jesus knew what he was going to do, but he was allowed to be there. He was allowed to be at table, even in the Last Supper. And this is when God smacks a pastor over the back of the head and says, he allowed you to be at that table too. He invites you to that table. He invites you every, every time you come up to this communion table. God is with you in the sanctuary as well. God knows us and loves us anyway. And Jesus still put trust in Judas at this point, even though, and we knew that, that Jesus trusted Judas from John 6, from way back at the beginning of the gospel. We know that Jesus puts trust in this man, sometimes maybe to reclaim somebody that has gone off the wrong path. Maybe we don't look at them with suspicion, but we look at them with trust. Maybe we give them some trust. Maybe instead of always thinking about the worst in people, we could think about the best in people. I wonder what discipleship would look like if we all thought about it that way. Now Judas, Judas is tempted and has temptation. And the funny thing about this temptation is it usually comes through that which we are naturally gifted. Judas is good at handling money, so the temptation comes with money. If you're a person that often handles money, there's a temptation there. If you're a person that is used to being in power or you supervise people, well, the temptation then is to make sure at whatever cost that you keep that power. And Judas says, why, why is she using this expensive perfume? Why not sell it? Do you know what we could do? We could give it to the poor. Why is she doing that? Judas's outlook on life, his perspective is revealed. It reveals what's in his heart. And Jesus' response is perfect. He says, let her alone. Let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. She understands what is coming and she will be there till the end. And then the last verse says, The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. The poor you always have with you. For centuries the church used this as a justification not to help the poor, but it's actually opposite of what it means. Jesus took this from Deuteronomy 15. The poor will never cease out of the land, therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to the needy and to the poor in the land. But you do not always have me. You do not always have me here and now. And we return to where we begin, the prelude. The prelude. At some point, the prelude has to end. We may love the song that Paul offers. We may want to listen to that all day long. But at some point, the prelude ends and we move into worship. They can't hold Jesus tight enough. He's going to go be with God. Right into Holy Week. And once Holy Week comes, Palm Sunday, the Passion, Easter, it comes fast and it comes quick and it comes, boom, one thing after another. Where are you in this prelude? Where do you find yourself in this prelude before the Holy Week? Are you Lazarus? Are you just sitting back and watching? And that's okay. There's a time for that. There's a time to sit back and watch things unfold in front of you. Are you Martha? Are you Martha? Is God calling you to be a person of service, to do something, something different, something unique? Are you Judas? Dare I say, is there a bit of Judas in your prelude? Are you thinking about how this will benefit you? I'm only going to do this if it benefits me. Or are you Mary? Are you Mary? Faithfully sitting, knowing that the only thing she has to give right now is praise and a little bit of perfume. Friends, we live in the shadow of the cross, but we also live in the presence of the risen Christ. 
This is our invitation today. Whatever it is, wherever it is you are, wherever it is you find yourself this week before Holy Week, we are invited to this table, one of compassion, generosity, and worship. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.